Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today on the podcast is a past guest. His name is Christopher Howard. You may remember him. He's studying to be a neuropsychologist, and he enjoyed being on the podcast so much, he decided he wanted to come back. <laughs> so Absolutely. thanks for joining me. How Christopher, sorry, I almost called you Howard. Oops. <laughs> No, that's not a problem. Call me Howard. That's all my friends call me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But no, thank you for having me back. I really appreciate it. Well, our first conversation I found super fascinating. I always learn new things, but you and I were touching on different communities, communities of color, and their specific issues with health, you know, health situations and memory situations. And so I was really excited when I got your email that you wanted to come back. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because we were going up against the hour and I was just like, you know what? I got a, a meeting and a couple of clients that I got to deal with and stuff. So I felt like I left you hanging. So I just wanted to make sure that we could finish everything with a nice little bow on it. So I'm back for round two. Sounds terrific. So I think in the email you were talking about some of the work that you had done in the various black communities, like within the churches, is that right? Uh, yes, you know what? Um, when I was in Chicago and I was like, before I joined, cause right now I'm doing my internship and I'm in Utah. And so my time's a little bit more limited, but when I was in Chicago, I started a couple organizations. One of them was Advocates for Community Wellness, where we go to some of Chicago's most underserved areas and promote mental health awareness. And a lot of, a huge component of um, Advocates for Community Wellness was um, faith-based, working in faith-based connections and working with different churches and stuff because they proved to be like a wonderful resource where it allowed us to like meet with different groups of people that perhaps we wouldn't normally have an opportunity to meet with. Um, I want to give a major shout out to Mrs. Dale Kane because she was the one who helped me organize Advocates for Community Wellness. Really, I helped her organize it. So it was just an amazing experience. Another thing that I did was called Neural Nerds. Um, <laughs> I, could I love probably that name. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, some of my professors did not like the name, but neural nurse is something that we also do. It's like community service projects. And we would go to some of Chicago's, maybe not underserved areas, but just different unique areas like Midwest, bring into a clubhouse and volunteer for a day and just help out with arts, crafts, whatever they needed. Um, also, we, we hosted a Halloween party at uh, Lydia's house, which was this little place on the north side of Chicago. And we got these children like school supplies, books, candies. And also we played this game called, what is it? And one of the things that we wanted to do was like blindfold the children. Um, and they would reach into a bucket and they would say, is it dry, is it wet, is it soft, is it whatever, in the spirit of Halloween. And we would get like the wet sand. So the kids would be like, okay, I know what everything is, but we get to this thing and we have no idea what it is. So it's just one of those things to like really promote mental health. Oh, something else that we did, we had a neural takeover at a high school on the south side of Chicago. Um, I can't think of the name of the high school, but it was really cool because, you know, kids were asked some of the most questions. Like, you could sit in meetings, you could sit in classes, you could go to conferences, but there's no questions like kids are going to ask. And what we really did was just really kind of promote, like, the abstinence of drugs, importance of exercise, getting good night's sleep, uh, nutrition, and just letting know people of color could be, like, neuropsychologists or they could pursue neuro in any capacity and we were recognized by INS International Neuropsychological Society for our community service project which was pretty cool um and you know I mean the kids were really excited they were engaged and they were just asking can somebody from the south side of Chicago really pursue neuroscience and that because my partner Anne and uh she's a neuropsychologist in New York right now but um you know we were like, yeah, look at us. If we can do it and we come from an environment similar to you, you guys can do it also. And we're just trying to lay the brick road to it. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's really, it's in, in my brain is tired today. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, I mean, I, I applaud you for doing the community service. I don't know if in our previous conversation, I told you that I'm a Rotarian. I think I did because that's where Rotary International is. And so community service is, is definitely a part of my household's heartbeat. And that's kind of why, you know, my husband's always saying, well, you know, 
I know you don't make any money with the podcast, but you're doing this good thing and it's just part of service and da 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 da. And so he's super supportive of of that. And so we're we're big on on serving your community and obviously Rotarians serve the world. And you never know, you might have inspired one of those teenagers. Uh, they might so. find the cure for <laughs> Alzheimer's or something. You never know. I hope so. I hope yeah, so. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Hopefully they hurry it up. <laughs> I know, me too. Me too. But, you know, I mean, that that's always an interesting thing. It's just like when you work with people from different communities, sometimes it takes like an out, like outside perspective to see something different in just a position to everybody else who has like a uniform perspective. So, you know, I won't be surprised if the cure to Alzheimer's comes from a place that we least expected. So, and just one last thing, um, we used to do community service projects at a uh, greater Holy temple church of God in Christ in the West side of Chicago. And if it wasn't for that church right there, I probably wouldn't have had an opportunity to work at Rush Alzheimer's disease center or Emory uh, department of rehabilitation medicine. So it just kind of goes to show like sometimes your platforms come from the least likely places. And it was just a small church in the West side of Chicago, but they really, projected me to some uh, amazing places. So I also want to acknowledge them with the community service effort. That's awesome. So I texted you some information that I had read, I think earlier this week or last week, about they did a, a research project on people's assumptions that they would have memory loss in old age. And people in poor health did not, they were, they assumed less that they would have this issue. People in good health assumed more that they would more likely have memory loss in their old age. And what I found fascinating and why I texted you was that the black community pretty much overwhelmingly assumed that they would not ever have memory loss in old age. And I was just like, yikes, that is just so out of the, that's just, it's 180 degrees wrong because we know that the black community is twice as likely to have Alzheimer's, which we talked about in our first conversation. Absolutely. And do you have any insight as to why that might be? Cause I just, that just blew my mind. That's why I was like sitting there at lunch reading this. And I'm like, I got to text this to Christopher. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it always boils down to access to healthcare because a lot of times when people think about dementia or they think about memory loss and stuff like that, they don't understand how it's insidious and how it's a process and everything that leads up into it. So often people think maybe it's a numbers game. Well, that happened to this person, that happened to this person, but it won't happen to me and different things like that. So you, it's this approach that, well, you know what, it's not going to happen to me or hopefully it doesn't happen to me and stuff like that. And even if it did happen to me, what could I do about it? And that's one of the things, like there's so many great programs, um, like I mentioned before, COACH, Center for Outreach, Alzheimer's Aging, Community Health, and North Carolina a and are doing some amazing things to really ingratiate themselves in the community to not only let people know that, hey, this is a strong possibility and a higher probability that you may receive some varying form of dementia, whether it be a mild cognitive impairment, your traditional Alzheimer's, cardiovascular dementia, so forth and so on, but not only well, you might develop it, but these are options and resources, even within your own community to, uh, to, you know, to resolve the issue. Whereas sometimes you look at certain groups of people and when you have like ample access to resource, you understand how this may be a problem and how this may be something that affects you. But because you have resources already available, there's more things for you to do to become proactive. So it kind of comes down to like the has and the have not. So one of the things that I'm really trying to do is just promote like mental health awareness. So people understand like these are, you don't have to suffer in silence or you don't have to say, well, maybe I might not get it. Hopefully I don't get it. I don't know what to do if it does happen, but now I have a strategy in order to like resolve these issues. Did I tell you about the pilot program that the Alzheimer's association, I guess it's the California chapters this uh, February 28, 2019, whatever year this is, we went and lobbied at our state capitol for $10 million to implement local community health departments to promote awareness and early diagnosis. Now, for people, 10 million bucks, that's a lot of money for the average person. It was sure. like 
a fraction of a percent of our state budget. <laughs> and despite the fact that Governor Newsom's father passed away from Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. he only gave us five. Is it five or eight? Doesn't matter. So we went from um, eight, I think it's eight health county health departments doing this program to six. So they, they figured out how to share that money <laughs> across the, the spectrum. And the, the requirements for the counties, they have to be diverse, um, ethnically, uh, financially. And I was just, I think, I, I don't know. I talked to so many people. I don't remember if I said this to you, but it's like, I need to follow up and see where we're at in that process. Because that was just what, uh, eight months ago, seven months ago, that we were there, and I think it was over the summer that they approved the money. Nothing in government moves quickly. <laughs> um, so, and then of course, I'm already signed up to do the Advocacy Day again in 2020. I don't know what we're gonna be asking for. <laughs> Maybe we're gonna ask for the $10 million again, I don't know. <laughs> but it just seems like, you know, we have to like really drill it down to the community level to let people know what the options are, what the services are, what, you know, you know, what the, Absolutely. what the warning signs are and everything just seems to need to be almost like on the, like boots on the ground kind of level. It's not like a national campaign that we can have, which I find kind of interesting. Absolutely. I think, I mean, but it takes, it takes somebody to be in the middle, right? Because if somebody's not familiar with the community, how the community works, the inner workings of the community, so forth and so on, then they may not know how to approach the community. Like they can want to help and they can do all amazing, wonderful things, but unless they're in the community and see how that community operates Sunday through Saturday, then they're not going to be able to know how to like really best serve that community. And sometimes people in the community, they might not have the privilege or the position or, you know, anything to be able to reach the higher ups, right? You know, because that takes a process, that takes politics to get involved in stuff. But sometimes when you have like a liaison between the two communities, I mean, that pays off dividends. Yeah, I think it's, I'm, I'm anxious to watch how these um, local health departments, you know, county health departments roll these out. I know my county is, it's fairly big. So they're, they're right in there. They're putting in their application, they're putting in their pitch. So hopefully Contra Costa County is one of the counties that, that gets the grant to do this. You know, but any place in Northern California, I'm gonna keep an eye on because it's just, it's, it's like I was part of, the, part of the process. So I kind of want to see how it ends up. And you know, I've, I've talked to so many people that they have, you know, they don't want to know. It's like, well, there's no cure, so why should I find out if I have Alzheimer's? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do between finding out and the end. You know, and sometimes that's the hardest thing, though, right? I mean, because people look at the just start of the problem and say, well, you know what? If I lose my memory, I'm not going to know it doesn't affect me. And what can you do, right? Like I said, I think I said this last time. Like, if I break my arm or break my leg, I can go to the doctor to get a fix. If I have high blood pressure, I can take medication. There's all the issue, whatever the case may be. But sometimes people look at Alzheimer's and say, okay, well, I have it. Now what? You know? But sometimes it's not necessarily just about that person. And it's about the caregivers, because I think particularly in the African-American community, African-American caregivers, like, pay the highest amount of money. And I was reading another article, and I was saying, like, African-American caregivers, like, through the course of the day, people have stress. Like, that kind of ebbs and flows. But stress is, like, peaked, like, the moment that you wake up. And it was just kind of saying that African-American caregivers, like, their stress doesn't ebb and flow, but it really just stays at that peak for a longer duration than other groups of people. So there is importance in resolving it because if you have opportunities, you have different things, you diet and train, exercise, diet change, um, getting services, intervention, all that stuff pays off dividend because sometimes it becomes down. Maybe it's not the length of life, but it's the quality of life that you live and stuff. And it's not just your quality of life, but it's about the people who are around you also. And sometimes people just think it's okay, I'm losing my memory, that's it. But they're not aware that's a personality change. It's not aware that there's a dietary change. There's so many different things that goes into it that it gets to the point that like you could like wake up in the middle of the night and just start wandering around and you might fall and hurt your hip and 
different things that are smart. And what it boils down to is that you're not the only person that's affected, but like your village around you becomes highly impacted. That's true. And like my mom, I don't think she ever admitted that she, I was not aware of her diagnosis until the beginning of 2018, like January, 2018. I told, we had an appointment with her doctor. I don't remember why. And I told him, I want to see your diagnosis. I want to know like what they didn't tell us. And I was shocked to realize that she wasn't diagnosed until September of 2011. And we'd been dealing with the memory issues for at least a decade. Like by the time she was diagnosed, she flunked all the memory tests with flying colors. <laughs> That's what I tell people. I mean, it wasn't that, you know, like we went to the neurologist earlier this year, this being 2019, and we had to redo all of her testing because I don't know why she's had the same health plan for years. They had no records from her neurology. And so she, the, the neurologist said, oh, so she, she refused to do the, you know, the pen and pencil test. And I'm like, oh no, she couldn't do it. She can't, yeah. she doesn't remember her name, which I find fascinating. She still speaks well. Like if you don't spend that much time with her, you don't realize, you know, she, a lot of people, there's like a gal that lives with, not with my mom, but they're in the same residence. She's Irish. So she uh -huh. speaks some Celtic and some <laughs> English and mostly mumble. Yeah. And you can't understand her. Occasionally there might be a word that pops out that you're like, ah, oh, English, I got it. <laughs> but it's not enough words. So you just have to kind of go with body language. But my mom seems very conversational and yeah. it's very difficult for people to realize that she's as far along in the disease as she is just because it's so different with her than other people. And that's what I find really fascinating. So I have a neuro, let's see, a neuropsych, tell me exactly what a neuropsychologist does. I don't remember if we talked about that before. <laughs> Great question. So a neuropsychologist looks at brain behavior relationships. So there's something that happens with the brain. Um, you kind of look at the behavior to kind of determine like, okay, you know, what's the correlation? And so, I mean, there's like, you know, so funny because when I was like an undergrad, I didn't even know what neuropsychologist was, but somewhere along the way, I kind of got bored with psychology. And I started a master's program in community counseling, which was kind of cool. But at that point, I started kind of learning more about neuropsychology. And um, one of the nurses who I used to work with, um, shouts out to Cheryl Cox. Uh, she was working at, I think it was called a Heritage Center. And she introduced me to like two neuropsychologists, um, Dr. Jay Weinstein and Dr. Stephen Ori. And I kind of like initiated the change in my forever because I was like, I like this. I like working at the brains, looking at the CAT scans, engaging with the people and stuff. And, and, and every, every part of psychology is needed. So this is an attempt to cast aspersions or dismiss any other people's fields, but I like neuropsychology. Um, and I met Dr. Stringer, and I was just thinking about this earlier today. Like, Dr. Stringer definitely changed my forever, and he's at Emory Department of Rehabilitation and Medicine. And leading up to that point, I mean, it's a couple of people. I'm sure I'll give them shots out uh, before everything's said and done. Um, but just having the opportunity to meet Dr. Stringer like 10 years before I actually worked with him. And I said, you set the precedence of what I want to do because you're everything. And I think he went to school with my mom, but my mom's a little bit older, so they didn't know each other. And um, Dr. Lisa Barnes, like, went, it's so funny because I know Dr. Barnes thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> um, I know she thinks I'm nuts, but when I think I was like a second year and I was working overnights at a hospital, a psychiatric hospital in Westside, Chicago. And like, so you get to a point in time when you're doing overnights, like usually around like, mm, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30, there's nothing else to do. So I was just scouring through the internet looking for like African-American neuropsychologists because I wanted a mentor. As, and mentorship is key for anybody who ever listens to this. Like mentorship is essential. But, you know, and I find Dr. Barnes and I'm just reading like different news articles about her. I said, this woman is fantastic. She's phenomenal. So half sleep, I wrote this page of an email just, hey, I've done this. I love what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And I sent it to her. See, at the time, I didn't know how busy people are. Like, like when you're like a renowned like neuropsychologist researcher. So I thought maybe she just wasn't interested. 
And, you know, my friends were just kind of get like, yo, if this is an opportunity, the worst thing she can do is just say no. So I sent her another one, like, long page and stuff. <laughs> and I even called her, like, at 4.30 in the morning just to, like, leave her a voicemail. Just, hey, I'm cur-. But you know how, like, when you don't talk for, like, four or five hours and you get the frog in your throat? And you sound like, rah, 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 rah. and, you know, I left her voicemail like that. So she finally um, returned my email. And she was just like, yeah, Chris, let's set aside the time to, to meet and stuff like that. And, you know, I came in. I was so nervous and my mouth was dry. But one of the things that Dr. Barnes really did for me was that she showed me what is possible from a community neuropsychology perspective. And to answer, answer your question, it's just like you look at how different things affect the brain, which essentially affects like behavior. So she kind of had this thing called community neuropsychology, or at least the blueprint of it. And I kind of created the name community neuropsychology. And that's one of the things that just kind of like changed my forever because I was just like, you're showing me something that I do not see in the classrooms, that I do not see in the textbooks, and I don't see too many places elsewhere. And so, I mean, I'm def- and she's helped me with like a couple of research projects. So I'm definitely indebted to Dr. Dr. Barnes. But I mean, that's kind of what neuropsychology is in a, in a nutshell, is just looking at that brain behavior relationship. And it's not necessarily predicated on talk therapy or psychotherapy, rather. So there's things going on in your brain that affect like your personality, your emotions. It's not necessarily like past childhood trauma or. Well, it could be. Well, it could be, Um, you know, and it's so funny because it's like when you do neural, you develop such a perspective that you always look for that connection between whatever the case may be in brain. And so there's certain articles that look at the epigenetics of trauma and stuff. Like if you come from, uh, a, a background where there's trauma, whether it's sexual abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, it can have a ramification in your adult life. And another research that they found is like just the perception of racism. The mere perception of racism has led to cognitive impairment in older life. So something that you experienced when you were like a young child can lead to cognitive impairments when you're a little bit older. And what that kind of centers on is stress and the way that stress can transform the brain or lead to neural anatomical changes. So I like, and that's the thing is just like, when you kind of like really delve into the field, you start seeing how a lot of things gravitate back towards the brain and how it can adversely or positively impact the brain. Well, we definitely know stress is, stress is poison. You oh, gotta keep the stress down, which is difficult. Yeah, we all we all have like things we have to do, things we want to do, and then the stuff that comes up and Yeah, I mean you're absolutely right. Like when I work with my when I do do therapy, like I, I do therapy rarely, but every every now and then. Um I try to I try to tell my clients to do, make a list. And with the, the list with the list, you the thing the stressors, the things you can't control, you put on one side, and the things that you can't control, you put on the other side. And that way, then you start moving forward and start trying to readjust your life and stuff because sometimes everything gets so convoluted that things that aren't necessarily impactful, you put them up on a pedestal and they become a little bit more damaging than they should be. So it's about the whole organization. So that's my therapy piece. (laughs) It's interesting because I talked to an elder care mediator. Her episode came out on, ah, the dog came in. <laughs> <laughs> Her episode came out on November 26th, 2019. This is because this I record and release later. Mm-hmm. And I had never heard of an elder care mediator. I thought, what the heck? You know, it's like. I'm sure. <laughs> and she has a business called Aging in Harmony. And mm-hmm. what she uses is a lot of the. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous, the Serenity Prayer, and it's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, I can see how that applies to those of us who don't have an alcohol problem. I don't really drink, so that, you know, it's like I, I hear it and I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense, but then you kind of dismiss it because it doesn't really apply. But you know, you're kind of repeating the same thing. You know, it's like, you know, grant me the serenity to change the things I can change and accept the things I can't. And I'm getting it probably really twisted, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I understand. It's, you know, a lot of times it's just about recognizing something. And that's something I also kind of do with my therapy clients is like, how do you feel in the moment? Right. Because sometimes you could get so bogged down with everything that you have to do so forth and so on and stuff that you don't realize that you're being stressed. And that was something that I was thinking about 
earlier today when I was coming into work, it's like, what does stress look and feel like? Because oftentimes it's so satiated because you go through it so often that you don't feel that off anymore, but it's still happening. So it's just like, if you could recognize what that stress is like, how it feels, when it's happening, when it's transpiring, and you can just meditate in the moment, you can just let it go and stuff. I think that's the that's one of the first couple of steps that you can do to disabusing like the chronic stress that's in your life or how it consumes you because some things you can control things, some things that you can't. And it's always easier said than done. I mean, people look at you and say, well, how can you, this is chronic stress. I got to pay these bills and I got to do this and I got to do and it's like, I get it, but it's how you approach it. Which is true. I, like I told you before we started recording, um, I'm trying really hard to get, the back episodes on my YouTube channel mm -hmm. and it's I'm doing it in bulk and sure. instead of just letting it overwhelm me it's like yes I got mm -hmm. 10 of them done and I and as I'm going through the process I'm like it's I'm mentally checking it off yep 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 okay this is great and it's just kind of shifting instead of like oh my god this is so much work and you know, then I look at, those are just the episodes that don't have the video recordings like sure. we're doing. Those are just the ones that I've converted to like a giant audiogram. I don't know why anybody would want to, you know, people like to listen to things on YouTube. So that's why they're there. <laughs> um, now I'm like, you know, I start looking at the, I think, years worth of episodes that do have video. And it's like, oh my God, that's going to take even longer. But it's like, you know what? I have like two months they're scheduled um twice a week i've got old episodes coming out until like early january and i'm like okay great so if i just get one a week one new one one old one starting at the beginning of the year this is good you know it's like yeah it feels overwhelming until you know like people say that old saying you know how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time <laughs> um not that i'm interested in eating an elephant but it's like, I'm trying, because my husband is super busy, and it's just like, I don't have somebody to assist with certain things. So it's like, okay, I have to do more in the same amount of time. So I, I'm finding if I just look at it as, well, there's another check mark off the checklist, the to-do list, there's another one. And, and it's kind of like focusing on the light at the end of the tunnel, which when you're caregiving, that's not so super easy. No. You know, you have to look at the short version of the tunnel, you know, and that's kind of what I do when I'm with my mom. There's times when it's like, what time? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've only been here for 20 minutes. Feels like an hour. <laughs> and I try Absolutely. to find, you know, enjoyable things to do with her, like go to the park and watch kids. And we went to the dog park once with all three of my dogs. And I just look, I try to focus on about 10 or 15 minute segments with her. That way I don't start getting really you know frustrated and stressed because it's you know i start the longer i spend with her the more the to-do list is just spinning through my head like you know like an old rolodex which might be a might be a reference you don't get either oh no no, no. Oh, oh, i get it <laughs> i get like, it <laughs> i'm getting older i do realize that um and so i'm just i'm finding that just shifting my perspective almost visually like you know mentally scratch off that on the to-do list and and kind of take 30 seconds to celebrate okay i uploaded 10 10 videos to youtube we've got faster internet upload these days how long is that going to take you know i go out start cooking dinner and my husband's like and i said don't do anything on the internet because it'll die because i'm uploading all these videos and he goes well how long has that been i'm like oh i don't know about an hour and a half he goes oh i bet you it's done so we go running in the office to see if it's done <laughs> i'm like sure enough it was done i'm like oh good okay well i'll worry about the rest of that tomorrow you know it's just yeah. you almost have to celebrate the little tiny you have to celebrate the small victories exactly and the small mm -hmm. successes like um my when we, the day we went to the dog park after so frustrating we go to the dog park it was veterans day so there's lots of people and kids and dogs and within 20 minutes it was just mom and i and my three dogs it was like what sure. <laughs> it was like we scare you guys all off <laughs> and you know we the my dogs played a little bit but they're two and a half five and 12 so there's sure. a big age difference and 
So I'm like, let's go to, you know, get some iced tea. My mom's like, that sounds good. So load everybody up in the car. We go to Pete's Coffee and Tea. And at one point, she's literally patting the table and telling me something about folding and blah, blah, blah. And nothing made sense. The words made sense, but it wasn't a sentence. True. And in the past, like the very recent past, I would say, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear all of that. Can you repeat it? And the last time I did this, I asked her to repeat it twice. Second time, she like yelled at me. <laughs> so the day of the dog park, we are at Pete's and she's whatever talking to me about, I don't even have a clue. And I said, oh yeah, that sounds fine. And that was totally, totally made her day. She was, she was fine with that response. I'm like, okay. So I was like, yes, you know, I didn't get into this weird I didn't understand you. Now she's frustrated. And I felt like that was a big win, which most people would not understand. But caregivers understand it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's like finding peace in the middle of a storm. Like, it's not always easy. It's not fair. But periodically, you get that break, right? Like, we're just all the man. It just kind of dissipates. And you just find this, this moment of peace. And those are the things that you kind of really relish and the things that you kind of cherish because it's just like, you know, okay, things aren't going smoothly, but they're not the worst that they could be. Or maybe they are going really bad, but you know what? I found a moment. Sometimes I find if I just stop, pet the dogs, you know, stop, close your eyes and take a few deep breaths. I mean, the whole world could be swirling around you like a hurricane or a tornado. We don't get any of those out here in California, <laughs> so my references are probably not right. <laughs> And, you know, just it, the world can just become an unglued, but you just close your eyes, breathe, and... Can't just, forget to breathe. Yeah, breathing is really important. And I used to work with a gal. I've never seen somebody smoke a cigarette in two minutes. I mean, like, <laughs> literally, she went out the one door and back in in two minutes. And I'm like, I, I, I'm like, did you smoke the whole thing? Oh, yeah. I'm like... I don't <sighs> smoke, never have. So I was like, ooh, that sounds nasty. But That's I would watch her. Was. Yeah, it was nasty. <laughs> and I don't think she was aware of it. She'd have panic attacks. And one day I watched her. She was literally sitting at the computer doing her work. And she's really shallow breathing, like almost panting. And I finally went over to her and I said, you need to take a deep breath. And she was a little bit taken aback, a little bit offended because <laughs> – you know, she, I don't think she realized, you know, she probably felt like she was, you know, relaxed and focused, but just watching her breathe was making me stressed. Sure. So breathing is definitely, definitely important. And sometimes it's the best thing you could do when you're about ready to just, you know, lose your mind, come unglued, scream at somebody. It's like, maybe just close your, close your brain, <laughs> close your <laughs> eyes and breathe. And I like to just maybe go step out on the porch or go out back and look at the mountain, just change yeah. a pace. You know, just, and of the one course. thing I've started doing recently, mostly because I've been trying to get more work done in, le in the same amount of time, is stopped reading so much news. Yeah, the news can be very dreadful sometimes. <laughs> like, it's just like, golly. <laughs> like, like, really? Yeah, geez. Like, the news can be so dreadful. But you know, I also found out that works also. And it's like having walking groups. Um, I know when I was in Atlanta, something that we were trying to like work on before I moved to Utah was like having caregiving walking groups and stuff because it's almost therapeutic because you're not just walking. I mean, walk groups, bike groups, anything where you're with other groups of people and you have an opportunity to share your story. Because like one of the things I think we may have talked about this last week or not last week, but last time was that when people really become in the throes of their their, their Alzheimer's or their dementia or whatever the case may be, is that they tend to isolate themselves from other groups of people, right? Socially, financially, emotionally, spiritually. And what was something that started out kind of small and you think you can take care of it, next thing you know, the burden falls on you. Sometimes family members who say that they're going to help and do all those other things, sometimes they don't really help or appear like they do. And sometimes it's not even thing that's malicious, but sometimes some people can't handle loved ones becoming sicker. And people grieve differently, or sometimes it's hard to change a loved one. Like, caregiving is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what degree you have, what walk of life you're from, or anything of the sort, 
caregiving is not for anybody, but one of the things that I found is like when you have like little groups or accountability partner, like you know how like when people are like finding their sobriety and they have someone that they hold them accountable, they hold each other accountable. So it's the same thing where it's like, okay, let's go walking and for 30 minutes out the day, you and I were going to walk or while you're walking, you're going to be on the phone with me. Tell me about your day. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what happened. Tell me the best thing, the worst thing and stuff and just get it out. Because sometimes when you hold on to something, it's like a seed. Like it starts out so small and so minuscule, but you hold on to it and you just let it fester. And as it continues to like get inside and grow and bigger and bigger and bigger, next you know something that started out so small is now paramount in your life. It's driving the negativity in your life. But imagine if you have like, three or four or five seeds that are festering and getting bigger and stuff. And so when you have an accountability partner, it's something that's, you know, it's not really costly, but it's something that like helps alleviate a lot of the stress. I mean, and that's what it's about. And that's kind of like what we're talking about is finding ways to alleviate the stress in the midst of chaos. Because sometimes like when people, and you go to scientific books and people talk about Alzheimer's and everything of the sort, it always talks about that one individual, individual, who's developed the disease, but it doesn't talk about how the disease has developed in somebody else or has developed in the caregiver, whether, you know, and what that's like and the changes that they go through. So, yeah, I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, it's interesting yeah. you said have groups because it's like my husband and I and our neighbors walk all five dogs when we can <laughs> and twice a week, although not this week yet because – Yesterday was so windy. I was not going out on my bike, but I, and there was only one person in our group that braved the 30 mile an hour gusty wind. And she, she said she might regret it. Um, so everybody did something else yesterday morning. I actually did an entirely different workout than I've ever done before. I was really glad it was only half an hour too, <laughs> because it was like, mm -hmm. Oh, this is tense. But it's like, there are days when it's like, man, I don't really know if I got two hours to spend with the cycle group, but I really need to go outside and get that sunshine and the socialization. But I got all this work to do. And sometimes it's like, you know what? The work can just wait. It'll be sure. there. I need It'll to come out there. because I know um, the winter of 2018, 2019 for California, we had 150% mm -hmm. of normal rainfall. Wow. Yeah, which is wonderful considering we had like five years of drought, but 150% of normal rainfall is not okay because <laughs> no. it rained like up till Memorial Day. And those of us that are like, I'm a multi-generational Californian, it was like, okay, time, it's time, <laughs> cut it off, it's supposed to be warm, I'm done. And there was literally one day in the middle of the winter, probably February, March, I'm walking across the house and I had this overwhelming feeling that I just wanted to like fling myself on the floor and just sob like some little kid. And I was sure. like, Whoa, life yeah. is not that bad. I mean, like <laughs> there's things, but Whoa, I'm like, okay, dogs, we're all going for a walk. And we walked for probably 45 minutes when I got home. I was like, ah, okay. I feel yeah. so much better now. <laughs> no, exercise is amazing. And like, that's one of the things that people, always like put on a back burner like when they become busy it's like okay this 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 and third exercise no you know and i mean I, I do the same thing too like some days some weeks you know you just have so many reports to write and so mentally taxing because you're trying to like figure something out like what is the genesis of this person's cognitive deficits and how does it manifest in their life what recommendations can i do or this person is coming for therapy and I have no idea what to say or what to do and stuff. You just get so wrapped up in those one things. And the first thing that you say is like, man, I'm so tired. I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to work out. I just want to go home, pop down on the couch, whatever the case may be, watch my dramas, watch uh, the basketball game, watch the football games. And I get it. But then it gets to a point where it's just like, you know what? I like how my second win, I probably could have done something. Right. And knowing that there's always something that can be do, it's just like, I don't want to shortchange myself. Uh, what you do now kind of like impacts what you do later. And Utah is gorgeous. A lot of people think Utah is, I don't know what people think Utah is, but Utah is gorgeous. And there's this street trail from my apartment complex to like the hospital. And it's like two miles there. And I didn't know I needed that walk sometimes. 
This is before I got my car. But that walk used to be so amazing because you would just walk, you see the homes, you see the mountains, you see other people out. It's like, it reminds you that you're alive. Then when you walk back, because, you know, Utah is like a high altitude state. So you still get that cardiovascular where your heart's pumping and you're breathing and you're just getting life into you. So I say all that to say is like, you can't forget to live. And a part of living is just exercising, even if it's just minimal exercising. And that's one of the things that we used to tell the people at Greater Holy Temple Church of God in Christ when we used to have like these little mental health seminars and stuff is like, Chicago, you guys get these bad winners, but here are some small exercises that you can do if you're a little bit older, you're less mobile, that you can still exercise. So you don't have to go from like November to maybe March-ish with these bad snowstorms, but you're not exercising. You want to keep the heart strong. You want to keep the blood pumping. And, you know, you want to be able to do different things. So, yeah. I have friends who don't cycle in the winter when it's raining because it's not safe and, like, yuck. <laughs> <laughs> and they always regret it come spring because now it's like, oh, you know, I'm all out of shape again. I got to build up my you know, my endurance for cycling and all that. And it's like, yeah, no, you could go to a spin class, right? Absolutely. And I've talked to caregivers who, you know, they would walk around the block or the park with their, you know, they'd walk around the park with their loved one and then the loved one declines. So they walk around the block and now, you know, maybe they walk around the yard and this one guy, like he just ended up walking around the house. And I thought, yeah. One, that would drive me bananas, but at least he was exercising. And what I Absolutely. did yesterday, which was really interesting because part of me was like, you know, maybe I'll just jump in the shower and get moving. But I'm like, I know what happens if I don't, if I don't work out a little bit in the morning, I get, I just, I don't feel right. It's weird. Cause I was oh. not a workout person like a little more than a decade ago <laughs> with my gym has just installed punching bags and they have a kickboxing class and it's half an hour and they have one at 8.30 and I have been advocating for 8.30 classes for like 10 years. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going and like, I'm, there's some road construction so I like barely made it on time but I got there and the 8.30 class wasn't full. The nine o'clock class, packed. So oh, I'm absolutely. like, and I'm like, and it was literally, I burned, I was sweatier than the hour class I did today. It, I had to think harder because he had like jab, jab, knee, elbow. And I'm like, <laughs> <"Ew."> <laughs> it's just like, um, you know, it was like jab, jab, right elbow. And I kept doing the left. I'm like, oh, this is insane. But it was really good for my brain because it was a totally different workout. And it was like, literally, I'm like, man, normally I'm starting to work out. And here I am driving out of the parking lot. So it was really, you know, changing things up is really, it's hard for me, but it was a really good thing to do. And I'm like, okay, well, if we ever start getting any rain, like we had 150% last year, so far this year we've had zero. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's like hit or miss, I guess. Um, yeah. I might do that class more often. I might get my own gloves. That way sure. I don't have to borrow the ones from the gym. But it's just, it's, I find also being out in the sunshine helps me a lot. And I, when I take my mom out, I find, you know, most people would not see this in her, but she has just, it's like a little bit brighter light is on for a little while when we're outside in the nature, in the fresh air, although we've been having some crappy air quality lately because of fires, yeah. but the sunshine, it's just, it's like the nature is so restorative. So I try to mix up my workouts between indoor and outdoor Hopefully we don't have 150% of our rain so that I don't feel like laying on the floor crying in the middle of the winter. Uh, no, I definitely understand. I hope you have a nice mix. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, let's see. It was like, you know, we had drought, then we had a hundred percent, then we had 75, then we had 150. I wish mother nature would just be like, here's the rain you need. And now we're done. <laughs> you know, it's like, it would be very pleasant. Yeah. And then where I live, we don't get snow, but we're not that far away. We're about two hours away from the snow if we want to go to the snow. Okay. That's what, that's what I tell people. Like, they're like, I actually had this woman ask me what was so great about California. And I was like, you did not just ask me that. And that's what I told her. I'm like, from where I live, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can drive to the desert, the ocean, you know, the orchards, the mountains. You pick. What do you want? 
That's you can incredible. get you can get there within a day or less. That's incredible. Yeah, I drove to LA. It took six hours. Oh wow, that's not bad. Yeah, you know, and I wasn't speeding because <laughs> I'm the one that'll get the ticket. Not a lot of speed, a little speeding. And then I thought well, I I missed the at the exit with all the food, so I got off at a town called Colinga. Mm -hmm. It's like, here's an exit calling. I'm like, okay, well, this is like a little small town. I'll go support their economy, right? <laughs> it was like 15 miles from the freeway to the little town. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Jeez. I was like, what the heck? This is California, people. I was like, right there on the freeway. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it took added about a half an hour just to get off the freeway to the pizza place and back on the freeway. But, yeah, it was kind of fun to look at a you know little small town. That, Absolutely. You know, it's Absolutely. Just, it's a whole chain, change your scenery, get out of your own head. That's my biggest problem. And uh, learn new things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I guess, I guess it's about creating opportunities. Um, that's the, and like knowing what makes people feel better and trying to disseminate that information to individuals who don't always have access to those things. Like, I, I guess that's our privilege maybe is that we can recognize these things and we can wake up and we can do things about it. And it's always something that's, you know, inspires me to say, how can I help um, individuals who don't have access? Like who are the least of these? Like who, how can I help? You know? So it's kind of one of my goals. Like one of my goals is like, I'm just kind of transitioning, but um I said, do I want to stay here in Utah once I'm officially done? But, you know, one of my goals is to go to a historically black college and university and not only be a professor, but if I have the opportunity to, like, be a clinical neuropsychologist where I can actually work with people and stuff, like, I was thinking about, like, what would it be like to go to, like, Alabama State, which is in Montgomery, uh, Alabama, and... Montgomery is like the de facto capital of Alabama's Black Belt, and now people have some place where they're comfortable, some place where they're familiar with, and we do the neuropsych testing for free through grants, and that way we can level the playing field. Because, or, and I, I posted this on Twitter, or being in the Mississippi Valley, and where used to be a lot of farming and cotton picking and so forth and so on, because where do these people go in their community? to be able to do the things that we just discussed. That is true. And if you know, like what I was trying to talk about, like last time we were talking, like with the stroke belt, that if African-Americans have developed Alzheimer's at a rate that's two to three times higher, and you live in like the stroke belt of some of these states, like it raises, it goes up 29%. It's like, well, where do these people go? Like we know that it exists. We know that it happens. What does that look like? Where do they go? And what can we do about it? Like, and so that's one of the things that I'm tasked with is saying, like, what, what can I do? So that's one of, that's one of my goals is to kind of do what we we're just talking about and give that serenity to other groups of people who may not normally have it. That sounds fantastic. It just seems like the way we're going to fix this disease and help people is really on the local community level with people like us. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a challenge that I look forward to. Um, you know, just being in Chicago, you see so much stuff. Because when I started my program, I was like broke, broke. And <laughs> I had to work, which is cool. And when you sit on the blue, blue line going out west, because um, I was working at um, Hartgrove Hospital, it's a psychiatric hospital. And eventually, I ended up working at East Garfield Park Hospital, taking a green line out west. You see different things, and you ask yourself, with my privilege, what can I do to resolve these issues? Like, what does mental health look like in an underserved area? And, like, just coming up underneath Dr. Barnes and Dr. Shaw, he's amazing, too. He also works at Rush. Like, Dr. Shaw, like, you at, like, he's almost like a machine because you ask him a question, you give him, like, just an idea that you write out, and he'll actually read everything. Um, but, um, you know, just coming up underneath them and like super encyclopedic, like, and those are like career goals, but you say to yourself, what can I do? Like Dr. Shaw was telling me, I was in his office and he's in the Illinois medical district. We have UIC, uh, Rush, uh, uh, it's like maybe two other hospitals there that's saluted me right now. And he was like, if you go to the next zip code over, the life expectancy drops by 12 years. 
That's insane. So when we talk about health disparities and cognitive aging, this is what we're talking about, where you can literally go across the street and that whole area across the street, life expectancy drops by 12 years. You have some of the most preeminent hospitals on the other side of the street. It's like, how can we find that liaison to level the mental health playing field? You go to certain communities and it's like mental health deserts where you can go miles and miles without having adequate mental health resources. So it becomes one of those things like you don't know what you don't know. So I don't know how to ask for help. I don't know how to seek services. So whatever's going on in my home, I have to deal with it alone. So, and that's why I think it's so important, like that neuropsychology, the neurosciences, whatever the case might be, begins to invest in historically black colleges and universities because it's, I mean, it's almost like a Wakanda, but <laughs> um, it's almost like a Wakanda, or it's one of those things where you have young, able-bodied students who are eager to learn and eager to serve, who are willing to go into these communities from which they come and work with these groups of people and just to position us. Because a lot of times what ends up happening in the mental health field is like, okay, you go to big name university, you work with prominent fe- professor, all of which is cool, but then sometimes you struggle working with people that you never encountered before. Um, so saying, how can we get people from these communities, people of color, you know, I would say HBCUs and African-Americans because I am African-Americans, but you know, for the Latino brothers and sisters, the same thing and say, okay, we recruit these people. They go back into places that most people can't normally reach and they're getting people involved and doing different things. And that's why uh, I'm so excited with what Dr. Gordy Bird is doing at North Carolina a t with the coach program. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of like everything in a nutshell, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm excited and, uh, I definitely have some plans of things I really, really, really want to pursue and just really think I can make it happen. And I think if I can make it happen, I can really like implement the change that I want to see. So I'm super excited about it. Well, you got six months and then you can start changing the world, right? Uh, I hope so. Well, I kind of, I kind of started changing the spark plugs right now. So, uh, I just have to keep, I just have to keep pushing and just kind of keep going. And that's why I'm so appreciative that you invited me on your podcast because in a way it kind of gives me a bigger platform. So even if I can't do it, like maybe somebody else will hear and be like, you know, this is a good idea. How can we continue to implement and do these activities? I agree. And like I said earlier with the California doing the programs within the local county health <clears throat> health departments pardon me i can see how that's really crucial and i just i really think that this is going to come down to like a community level just because alzheimer's is so different in each person that you can't just have a blanket solution or blanket services and like oh, okay well you've been diagnosed so here you're going to go do a b and c that doesn't necessarily fit everybody, which is the biggest challenge with this disease. With this disease. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, absolutely. But it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a community effort. Uh, I mean, routinely you hear about different findings in the field and you hear about, you know, different accomplishments, but it always was that, well, how does that affect my community? And I mean, from a selfish standpoint, but, you know, when you have loved ones and people that you really care about, you know, you want them to do well. I remember it was a Christmas, and um, I came home, and I was at my old church, and I had my Emory Alzheimer's disease sitting my shirt on, or fleece on. I mean, it was pretty cool. And when people, see, when people saw it, they would say, we need a you in our community because we know you're fighting and you're going to do it. Like you're not just wearing the fleece, just like a, Hey, look at me, but it's something that you're committed to doing. And it's just like, when you get tired, those are the moments that you think about, or when you see the people in your community who are suffering in silence and the residual impact that it has, it gives you that second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth win to say, let me go back to the field. And it's one of those things why it's so important, like we were discussing, like to raise a point, uh, raise, um, raise a notification, even in the community level, because you have these big trials where they spend like millions of dollars, teetering on billions of dollars, but they don't include anybody that looks like us. So it's like, okay, even if you find the cure, is that going to help me and the people in my community? You know what I mean? So it's, it's always about the advocacy. I mean, the clinical work is amazing. It's special, it's unique, but the advocacy is just equally important. 
I completely agree. Yeah. So well, I definitely sure applaud you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, I'm sure we're going to talk again. You're going to be my unofficial co-host. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm here for it. Yeah, no, thank you so much for this opportunity. I well, really like I said, our first conversation, I was just, you know, I was, it was just absolutely fascinated. I love learning new things, and this is a really fun way to learn new things. And there's a gal in my support group. I'm going to give her a shout out because she's a listener. And I told her, <laughs> I think it was last week, I, I said, it's not out yet. I don't know when it's coming out yet. I said, but you're going to love listening to this guy because it was so fascinating. <laughs> and Thank you, know, you so, so much. So I, really, she, <laughs> I have her primed and ready to go. <laughs> absolutely. Well, hopefully, hopefully I delivered. Uh, I mean, I really love this platform. I really love this. And um, it's just really speaking things into existence and just really getting everything out there. Um, I think the future is bright for all of us. And um, I, can't wait, I can't wait to indulge in it, you know? Yeah, me too. <laughs> and you give me a thought because you're talking about um, health care and mental health care like deserts. And yes. I just recently talked to a guest from Canada. So I'm going to go back and message him. He's also on Twitter. And... <laughs> I find a lot of people on Twitter Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm going to ask him if they have a similar healthcare deserts where you, like you said, you go the next zip code over across the street and the life expectancy drops because I'm wondering, is that just part of our broken healthcare system or is that, you know, cause that seems like a really simplistic answer. So I don't think that's all of it, but I'm going to go do some research because now I'm curious and that's what all of these and when I talk to different guests, I get curious about new things. So Absolutely. I mean, I, I, it's definitely something worth exploring. Uh, I think if we start talking about, like, the mental health deserts, I mean, we'll, we'll be on the podcast for another hour. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it's just one of those things, like, how do you get people – I mean, because one of the biggest things, and, and I'm not going to go off on a tangent like I did before, at least I'll try not to, <laughs> but it's about getting people who are invested in that community. Because some people work there because it's a job and it's this and it's that. And they're kind of like really burnt out or they're disinterested or whatever. And you have some people who say there's no other place that I'd rather be than on the west side of Chicago or east Atlanta or whatever the case may be. Because this gives me an opportunity to really implement the changes that I want to see and really be able to talk to the people, reach out to the churches. And a lot of times when you talk about churches, people will say that you're trying to evangelize or anything, or at least want to salvation. And that's not necessarily the case. But faith, 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 if I could say it, faith based mental health is not necessarily the new frontier because it's going on for a while. I remember when I was younger, there was people with intellectual challenges at my grandma's church. And back then there was, you know, sometimes, you know, someone had intellectual challenges. There was a certain stigma attached, but my grandma's church, St. Augustine, a Catholic church in South Bend, Indiana, would take these individuals and they would go to Notre Dame games, they would go to Potawatomi Park, they would do different activities, they would teach them like learning skills so at some point they could have like a job and maintain and different things and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of utility. I guess what I'm getting at is that there's a lot of utility and just faith faith-based practices in terms of mental health, especially in terms of Alzheimer's and dementia and stuff, because it just gives an excellent platform to really reach groups of people who are often neglected. I believe it. This is going to sound like a really off-the-wall question. You ever watch the TV show New Amsterdam? You know, I just started watching it, um, you know, because I used to watch This Is Us, but now it comes on the same time as Blackish and Mixed and Mixedish, which I really like both shows and stuff like that. So, but the moment that Blackish goes off, I always turn to New Amsterdam because I remember I was like looking for something because I said, I'm not ready to go to bed, but I want something to watch TV or whatever. And I turned on to New Amsterdam and they were working with um, these African Americans in the barbershop. That's exactly and, what um, I was getting at. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's so funny because I can't think of, I got a frat, bruh. Um, I'm an honorable member of Kappa Alpha Psi, but uh, he's uh, man. Matter of fact, he's from Oakland, but he lives in Los Angeles, and his um, event is called Trap Medicine. And eventually, they go to different barber shops around South Central Los Angeles, and basically, I think either they get free haircuts and they promote like cardiovascular disease and like awareness and how to take care of yourself. Man, um. Oh, I can't think of his name, um, but 
His organization is called Trap Medicine. He went to uh, Morehouse uh, University. Um, so that's going to bother me. <laughs> but I, I encourage you guys to definitely look at Trap Medicine if you guys ever listen to this. And um, it's because he's doing some positive things. Yeah, what I the reason I brought uh, Jamil that up, Lacey, Jamil Lacey, that's Jamil it, Jamil Lacey. Lacey. Yeah, cool. check him out. Yeah. The reason I brought that up was because the white doctor was sitting in the black barber shop wanting to promote cardiovascular health, like blood pressure testing and all that stuff, and he wasn't part of their community, so they were ignoring him. And so he gets the bright idea to teach the barbers how to do the testing. Now they're not medically trained and of course the board of the hospital has a tizzy fit and i guess somebody goes and and they see the barber is doing the you know the testing i think they might have been doing um blood sugar testing too sure. i watch kind of late at night and i watch for entertainment and then just it kind of exits the brain it doesn't doesn't i don't need the details to remain but sure. i just remember every time i talk to you i think about that episode and how you know he was trying the white director of medicine doctor was trying to help communities help themselves. There's, and it, and there's, I think, I do think that's important. It is. There's so much utility in the barbershop. It is. I remember cause uh, I think I talked about last time uh, we were hosting an event at my church uh, called the power of three. And one of the places that really helped promote was the barbershop. And it's one of those things when people see that you're from a community and they believe what you're doing and stuff. Like, I can only go to a barbershop for so long that I got other things to do. But if those barbers are cutting hair all day and they kind of promote and they talk to different groups of people and stuff about what you're doing, the importance of it because you gave them the blueprint of what to do. That's like additional promotion. And it was like a badge of honor because I was thinking like, here I am from the suburbs of Indianapolis and get my hair cut in the west side of Chicago when, you know, I was taking classes in my doctorate program and they thought so highly of my event, they let me hang the poster, you know, to like with all the other things that they promote in the community. Like it was like, like, you know, a, a badge of honor. And it's just one of those things when people see, because when people see what you do, and this is what makes it so unique because I wear like a neuro nerd sweatshirt or community neuropsychology sweatshirt. And what ends up happening is like, you could be in the most obscure areas and people say, my auntie, my uncle, my granddad, my grandmama, my whomever, they had some form of Alzheimer's or they had a stroke. Or they had all this stuff and we didn't know what to do. But when we see you, let us pass you with the pester you with these questions because you're a resource that we don't normally have. And that's why, I like, you know, that's why I'm so committed to, like, this whole idea of community neuropsychology and cognitive aging and health disparity because I believe that there's utility. And I think, like, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. And I think there's so much more to do with it. I agree. Mm-hmm. Well, I should probably let you get home to dinner. Yeah, the Colts are playing. <laughs> <laughs> the Colts are playing in Houston's on Thursday night football. So I'm definitely going to try to grab a salad and uh, make it home. Sounds like a plan. Are you walking or driving? Because that two-mile walk sounds good. Uh, I'm driving. It's, it's, it's starting to get cold and it's raining outside. So. Oh. <laughs> well, we finally got cold this week. And like I said yesterday, it was super, super windy. Ugh. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's not that cold. We went and walked the dogs last night. And the wind had died down. So, can we walk about two miles? Oh, that's the good. Old, the old dog has a trouble. Um, he has to wear shoes, dog shoes, because he's sure. got... Um, nerve arthritis so two miles isn't too far so you need to do that you need to do the two mile walk whenever you can i know i know i know <laughs> <laughs> if the colts weren't playing tonight then i'll probably go to the gym and like get my exercise on but you know what i'm going home <laughs> <laughs> well that sounds great and i appreciate that you wanted to be back on again that i didn't That's scare you off <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm really, I'm really, really, really excited. And, you know, I really look forward to hearing this podcast. I uh, just really look forward to being a part of everything that you're doing. Like, it's, uh, it's amazing, you know? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm working on it. And like I said, I learn a lot too. So it's been a really big benefit. So I'll let you watch the Colts. I'm not into football, but I'm going to, that is football, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's football. I was like, wait a second, is that basketball? No, it's football. I'm going to go make dinner. I don't know what happened to the husband. He thought he'd be home before we started recording, and he's not. So <laughs> I have to go look at the uh, 
find my friends on my Apple phone. So <laughs> track them down. <laughs> Absolutely. All righty. Absolutely. Well, you have a terrific evening. And likewise. Likewise. And I thank will. you so, so much. All righty. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.